to all our colleagues and friends of the International Crisis Group. My name is Comfort Aero, and I'm the Interim Vice President and Director of Crisis Group's Africa Programme. Um, I'm sincerely appreciative um, of your presence, even if I can't see um, all of you, I, I know that you're, you're there. Um, for those of you who are not um, familiar with, um, with Crisis Group's work, let me take a brief moment um, to tell you briefly about who we are. Um, Crisis Group um, is a 25-year-old organization, an independent organization working to prevent wars and to shape policies that can sustain and build peace. Um, our mandate um, is to engage um, all parties and to support efforts to prevent, mitigate and resolve um, violent and deadly um, conflict. Um, we do this by sounding the, the alarm bell, um, providing independent and field-based um, high-quality um, analysis and engaging directly um, with all conflict actors um, and key international players like many of you who are joining us on the, on the call today, um, with the aim of encouraging and informing and providing sort of intelligent action um, that can help shift the policy dial um, towards a sustainable outcome. Um, this afternoon, we are all connected um, for a rather um, important public exchange with our European policy community, um, looking at the critical intersection um, between technology and violent conflict and exchange um, on ways in which technology and in particular social media um, is transforming conflicts or fragile political settings. It's also a very timely um, moment for those of you who have been following um, developments in, in Nigeria and the current fallout um, there following the president's decision um, to suspend Twitter. And that sort of action was is a reminder to many of us of how sort of social media um, continues to be a double-edged sword, um, sword in certain um, contexts as well that we work in. I'm very pleased um, today um, that our participants um, include policy practitioners, regional experts, um, El Salvador, um, Venezuela, Cameroon, um, for example, and Myanmar, and, and diplomats working on peace and security um, within the European Union um, amongst its member states, as well as colleagues from civil society and international organizations. So, so we've got a quite a diverse group of, of experts um, that are going to engage in this very sort of important and timely conversation that we're having today. Let me also take this opportunity to mention that the event that we're conducting today is being recorded and is live on stream via um, our website, um, www.crisisgroup.org, and also via our YouTube um, channel. Um, you can interact with questions and comments in the event um, page, and we do encourage you to um, sort of be animated in your discussion um, and to also use social media um, for the for the conversation, um, because you know while we're talking about the use of social media in in conflict, also does um, lend itself to be naturally a very important platform um, to raise these concerns. Um, please um, use the um, hashtag recording if you are in going progress. To, if you are going to um, engage in the conversation, we are using the the hashtag called um, hashtag crisis talks as well. Um, our talks today, Crisis Talks, um, will be structured around two sessions um, covering a, a number of case studies um, for all of you. In the very first session, um, we will address the role of state actors, um, looking at how these state actors um, often sort of use social media to their advantage to either um, shape public narratives um, around their interest or as we've seen in certain contexts, to um, constrain the access and voice of opposition groupings as well as civil society as well. And then in the second section, um, we will then turn our attention to those very opposition groupings and civil society, uh, but looking particularly at non-state actors and discuss how they have intervened and used social media in the, in the various conflict dynamics. Um, that we'll be looking at as well. And th these are a range of case studies that, that we're looking at, as I mentioned, El Salvador, Venezuela, um, um, Myanmar and Cameroon as well. And in all these issues, um, these issues have become of greater relevance um, with the expanding um, digital space in all aspects of, of our life. And also 
So this is true, um, as we've seen at Crisis Group and in other places um, in, fra in the fragile context that, in which we, we work in. And it's very clear to us by the research that, that we have done um, in all these various um, places, including um, Libya, I, I should I should add, you know, coming up with very compelling um, evidence um, that more attention is required to equip very various institutions, um, conflict actors and practitioners um, with the appropriate um, understanding and capacity to sort of to act to prevent conflicts that might be nourished by harmful rhetoric, um, by hate speech and misinformation in the, in the digital age. And this question is even more crucial um, to our, our colleagues um, at the European Union um, and its member states who have welcomed um, this conversation um, with crisis group which is why we're having this pu public conversation today and and it's even more central because in a, in a number of the spaces and where we operate in a number of the um, conflict settings that we're talking about European actors are very um, important players um, right at the center of some of these conflicts that we're going to address today whether it's in Venezuela or Myanmar or, or Libya or, or Cameroon and you know they're and so a more granular understanding of the role of sort of new technologies and social media um, can significantly increase the conflict sensitivity of diplomatic engagement, of conflict prevention initiatives, and also support various programs, for example, those that are initiated by the European Union as well. And indeed, this crisis talk um, is also part of Crisis Group's own ongoing collaboration now with the European Union. And I wish to acknowledge the partnership um, with the European um, Union Commission through the instrument contributing to stability and peace and the collaboration with the European External Action Services also. Um, and also as a testimony to this lively cooperation, um, it gives me great pleasure um, to introduce Mr. Simon Borgens Muller, and I, I hope I didn't um, spoil your name. Um, and I really welcome you into this virtual room, Simon. Um, Simon is the acting head of Unit for Stability and Peace at the European Union's Commission Services for Foreign Policy Instruments. And that Stability and Peace Unit at the Commission manages the EU's um, conflict prevention, peace building and crisis response in approximately 70 countries around the world at any one point. And it is a leading partner in those areas where Crisis Group encourages the, the EU and works collaboratively um, um, with the U European Union um, to share, think through um, policy initiatives and to think through the pathways out um, of a number of crises that, that, that we're working on as well. Um, before joining the, the Service for Foreign Policy Instruments in 2018, um, Simon worked for 14 years um, in the EU delegation in the Middle East, um, including um, over 10 years in Syria, um, where he also served as acting head of delegation and head of public affairs, uh, political affairs in the EU delegations in Libya, Jordan and Yemen. So he comes with vast experience and he would have seen um, how social media um, had been had played out in a number of these settings. Um, Simon holds a, a, a master's in international inter, interdisciplinary European studies. And you know, Simon, it's a real pleasure to have you um, here with us today. Thank you very much um, for making yourself available. And I, I hope that um, we'll have a really good back and forth to enrich our talks. Um, I'm going to hand over the, the floor to you, the, the virtual floor, um, for your introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much, uh, Comfort. Uh, I'm very happy to, to be here to offer a few opening remarks on behalf of, of the Service Foreign Policy Instruments, which is, is very happy to support this event um, and to have a long-standing partnership with uh, the International Crisis Group. Um, we now have this event financed through a project on strengthening EU early warning, conflict prevention and crisis response. And I think uh, today's uh, discussion is, is right on uh, what we wanted uh, to have out of, of this project. Um, and I'm looking very much forward to the, the, to the discussion. So when we started our collaboration with ICG back in, in 2013, uh, social media was perhaps not an obvious subject for conflict talk, but um, today it definitely is. Um, the COVID pandemic has dramatically increased the attention 
and the funding uh, given to the subject of social media disinformation, conflict, and uh, and peace. We are now all familiar with the potentially harmful online content, uh, or the potential harmful online content has to fuel tensions and trigger outbreaks of of violence. We have seen how um, how vulnerable most societies are to efforts to polarize opinions and to undermine public trust either in, in state authority or in other cases in civil society organizations. And these are dynamics we've seen in Europe, we've seen them in the US and, and throughout the world. And obviously the effects of these dynamics uh, are much more uh, harmful in uh, contexts that are already suffering from, from conflict. Um, so while we've seen dynamics uh, play out in this field for, for a few years, we are yet uh, fully to grasp the magnitude of these new drivers of conflict. So while propaganda and campaigns of hate have always been, been used to shape popular representation or, or to mobilize support in times of, of crisis and war, um, we are not used to seeing it at the the scale and the speed that we are seeing now uh, with the rise of social media as a main source of information and of social interaction for, for, for many of us. So in order to better respond to these dynamics, the first thing we have to do is to understand them better. Uh, we need to analyze how disinformation campaigns are being orchestrated and why they are being orchestrated. We need to gather more facts and evidence up the links between online harm and offline violence to better understand uh, how the dynamics are. We need uh, to understand the context in which these inform information flows are developed and very importantly who the local actors and local narratives are that are best placed to respond and counter this harmful content. Um, so within the, the service for foreign policy instruments, we have supported many initiatives over the years in response to, to violent extremist propaganda and narratives. But it's only in the last couple of years that we are stepping up uh, our engagement with the social media companies as well to engage with them in a conversation on, um, on the issue of conflict and peace building in a broader sense. So uh, while the, the social media platforms are starting to realize their corporate responsibilities, um, and which is something we very much welcome, their engagement in, in conflict-affected context is still marginal and need to be further encouraged and very importantly to be accompanied as well. Uh, and we believe that through uh, collaboration with, so with social media platforms, with peace builders, civil society, activists, academics, uh, and, and technical experts, um, we, as well as, of course, the, the regulatory bodies, will be uh, able to raise awareness of particular situations where we need more attention. Uh, we've seen that happen in the past with election processes, and we hope we can also broaden that to, to further processes and then to help find appropriate action uh, in terms of moderation and, and, uh, and management of uh, algorithms and so forth. So I will not take more time from, from the discussion now. Um, I will just thank you very much uh, for organizing this event and giving us uh, the opportunity to exchange and, and learn from uh, the speakers and for, from the participants today. Thank you very much, Comrade. Thank you very much. I mean, you, you sort of laid out sort of all the key issues that we need to, to cover, understand you know, very much what is happening on the ground, and then to think through the various um, ways in which we can re respond um, to those to those issues as well. Um, before handing over to my colleague, um, our Director of Communications, um, Hugh Pope, um, who will moderate um, the, the panel sessions for us um, this afternoon, let me first um, launch uh, a short video. I'm very excited to launch this, this video um, where um, our interim um, director for our, our Future of Conflict um, program and our chief um, strategist, Rob Bletcher, and our senior um, analyst on, on social media, um, Jane Esberg, will introduce Crisis Group's work on the future of conflict and social media.
Um, thank you all. And I wish you all um, a very good, productive um, afternoon also. Thank you. We've been developing, We've been our, future developing our future of conflict in the past few years. It has three pillars. The first is technology and conflict uh, with a special focus on social media. Second is climate and conflict, which looks at climate as a threat multiplier that, that exacerbates other conflict risks. And third, the economics of conflict, which uses innovative data and economic techniques to explore war economies and the role of the private sector in the peace and security realm. Our future of conflict work starts from the same premise that all crisis group work does, that putting local granular research at the center of our analysis yields the most important insights for preventing and resolving conflict. That's why all of our thematic work is done jointly with our regional work so that the two reinforce each other. Social media has just fundamentally changed how we communicate, what information we see, whose ideas we see. And this has come with greater opportunities for freedom of information, government accountability, and online activism. For many, this was really exemplified by the Arab Spring, which some dubbed the Twitter revolution. But social media has also been used to exacerbate conflicts, in some cases strategically. Misinformation and disinformation, hate speech, and propaganda have all affected conflict dynamics. In the Rohingya crisis, Myanmar's military fed an existing ethno-religious tension to its boiling point, often through false or misleading information designed to vilify the Muslim minority, which caused widespread violence and drove hundreds of thousands of Rohingya from the country. ISIS has used social media for propaganda and recruitment, including in the West. During the Israel-Palestine conflict, we saw the organization of anti-Palestinian violence via WhatsApp. But there are also a lot of positive dimensions to social media. It's allowed greater communication among activists, increasingly allowing citizens to directly challenge their governments. In areas where traditional media is largely state controlled, it offers independent sources of information, and it's been critical in tracking and disseminating information about human rights and conflict dynamics on the ground. The International Crisis Group's research often highlights these tensions. Social media has been central to activism after Myanmar's coup, even though the military previously used it to fuel violence. Social media has provided independent sources of news in Cameroon, even as, as it facilitates hate speech. Social media has been important for the Venezuelan opposition, increasingly in exile, to communicate among one another, but it is reflecting and exacerbating polarization as well. Social media companies and governments are struggling to govern online spaces in a way that preserves this freedom of expression but doesn't actually fuel violence. And this is in part a challenge because of the unique dynamics of different crises and how, and how social media influences these dynamics. Reducing harm will require understanding the impact of social media and moderation policies on specific conflicts. Slido. Um, this is the platform you will have to use if you want to ask questions. Um, you can do this in two ways. One is to interact with the dedicated page on our website, uh, just below the, uh, the uh, YouTube stream on, on our website, or by joining Slido directly. Uh, you may have to do this if your cookies are blocking, blocking it on the website. So you go to slido.com or slide.do and enter the code hashtag ICG under join as participant. And um, if you're all seeing it now, um, I'd like to just try it with a first poll. Um, it'll be pretty easy. It will also give us a, a nice idea of the audience we have with us today. So if you uh, could slide that onto the screen, um, colleagues, and we'll see if, if we can get this to work. So just a few minutes to 
well, a few seconds to have a look. I'm sure it's a, it's a pretty easy question. And there we go. Three so far. Five. It's okay, it's slido.com or slido.do. Okay, I'll let this run a bit. It, it's it's a, just to add to Simon's point about how important social media has become, I'll just keep talking while you fill in that uh, poll. Uh, one amazing thing is that more than half of the world's population are now active social media users. So it's hardly surprising that it's become a natural extension of the, the conflict environments in which uh, Crisis Group specializes. And the other amazing part of that is on average, these 4.2 billion users have accounts on eight different platforms platforms and spend two and a half hours per day on social media. That, I got that information from a new uh, overview by Swiss Peace in the UN, which is a very interesting source of information on the impact of social media on mediation. Um, social media is obviously also playing a big, an increasing role in armed conflicts. Um, it impacts how conflict actors communicate with one another and, how the, and with the public, how information is disseminated how the outside world perceives conflicts, and most fundamentally, how armed conflicts are increasingly fought. Um, Simon and Jane have pointed out the negatives and positives. So let's try uh, uh, another uh, another panel. Let's see where we've got to on this. With 25 people have found their way to slide it. Okay, let's just try the, the second poll, colleagues, and uh, see whether we can try this again before we go to the first panel. And this, this will be to judge what you think the role of social media in conflict is. So if we could slide that new poll on there, we have we have a fairly clear result from the the sample of 26 who are able to answer the first question, with two thirds having some some knowledge, and about a quarter having. Uh, uh, Okay, here we go with the second one. What, in your view, will social media, what role, in your view, will social media play in fragile contexts in the future? Um, looks like everyone's getting into this faster. Uh, it's um, the positives, obviously, state, state mediators and uh, conflict prevention organizations like our own crisis group can uh, listen to social media to know more about a conflict, to hear independent views, to find out what the opposition is thinking and right down to a very granular level. At the same time, states and mediators and uh, everyone can use the, uh, the social media to shape the messages. So uh, you can also, you know, the democratic opposition is also can, can use it so it's positive. Um, the negatives, obviously, sensationalism has an exaggerated impact. There are myriad inauthentic uh, coordinated campaigns using the famous bots and uh, sometimes uh, troll farms and so forth. Uh, relatively few users are producing most of the content, which is a dangerous side of things. And then increasingly, many social media platforms are actually closed. You can't see what's going on and they're encrypted. Um, so let's see where we've got that. We've got 29 of our guests have looked and two thirds think that it is growing increasingly problematic. A neutral, only one tenth think that uh, that there is going to it's going to enable or strengthen freedom of speech or democratization. That's interesting. So a, a pessimistic audience. That's um, let, let's see. So that's right. Thanks for 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 doing our first two ever online polls at International Crisis Group. That, that was uh, that was great. Uh, and uh, we will now turn to our first panel. Um, this this panel is uh, dealing with social media and state actors in conflict. And uh, so there's very much uh, what uh, officialdom and, uh, and state institutions can do. And for this, uh, you've already seen Jason, Jane Esberg speaking on the video, um, and she's going to address, uh, I think, about El Salvador. Uh, Jane is our Crisis Group's Fellow on Economics and Conflict, and she's also coming to join us full time as the Senior Analyst for Social Media and Conflict. And what Jane does is she integrates quantitative and text analysis methods with crisis groups work on criminal and political violence um, with a regional focus, especially on Latin America. 
Uh, Jane is a, a visiting fellow at Princeton University, and her PhD in political science comes from Stanford University. And her dissertation uh, used original microdata to study the relationship between popular support and repression during Chile's authoritarian regime. So uh, welcome, Jane. Um, and I'm going to be asking the same question to all our panelists as they come on. Um, and that is, we see governments often actively working to use social media nowadays to their to their advantage, whether by monitoring and limiting the opposition's communication capacities, or like in Nigeria, switching the whole, there's a whole of Twitter off, or spreading their own messages. Um, from your perspective, can you just give us an outline of how you see a state actors using social media and how that is actually affecting conflicts today? Great, thanks so much here. So, so as you mentioned, I'm going to be focusing on some research that, that I did with Crisis Group on El Salvador. Uh, there are really very few places in the world right now where Twitter is more central to politics than El Salvador. The, the president, Nayib Bukele, uses memes and hashtags to communicate his policy positions, respond to critics. He regularly uses the platform to attack his opponents. The economist ran a story about him called, My Tweet is Your Command. Uh, our research on El Salvador highlights how social media can really polarize debates over how to solve conflict, in this case, over for security policy dealing with gang violence. Fights between Bukele and his critics often play out online because of the central importance of Twitter to his administration. Uh, Bukele's really flagship success in El Salvador is that he oversaw a historic drop in the murder rate, which for years was among the highest in the world due to gang violence. But in doing so, he has pursued uh, controversial hardline policies, including violating human rights through extrajudicial killings and prison overcrowding. In trying to fund his security bill, he had the military occupy the legislature. So his supporters say he's brought peace and security, and his critics say he's eroding democracy. So to explore this dynamic, we, we did an analysis of two competing hashtags that were popular about a year ago. Uh, hashtag Bukele Dictador focuses on Bukele as a human rights violator and dictator with tweets like prohibited from thinking, prohibit, forbidden from dissenting, Bukele Dictador, God will judge you, tyrant. Uh, que bonita dictadora, or what a lovely dictatorship, painted Bukele as this bearer of peace. Most often these tweets showed the police or the military doing a good deed, like carrying a bag of rice for an elderly woman with text like, is this what a dictatorship looks like? So what a lovely dictatorship was clearly designed by pro-government leaders. The hashtag was first used by a communication strategist who the newspaper El Faro alleged ran a propaganda machine for an ex-prosecutor who's now in prison. The strategist used the hashtag three times in rapid succession, then two hours later, published a story about its explosion on social media on a digital publication that he himself owns, even though at the time it had only been used 620 times. Uh, most of the images showed the military doing, showing the military doing good uh, were from Bukele's communications department. And these messages were then artificially boosted. So while it's difficult to firmly identify evidence of bots or trolls online for a variety of reasons, there's really good reason to believe that they are being used in El Salvador, both Bukele and the opposition party, the FMLN, have been accused of being involved in troll centers, which are a bunch of young people being paid to post particular messaging online, often under multiple accounts. One way of seeing suspicious accounts is to look at when they were created. So I'm going to show a graph that shows when, uh, when the accounts that used these two hashtags were created. Hopefully you can see it on Slido shortly. Uh, so as Twitter basically removes and identifies suspicious accounts, new ones have to replace them. So one of the easiest ways to, to see some evidence of suspicious accounts is to see a, a boost in brand new accounts. Uh, so in total, in the period uh, we studied, about 5% of Bukele Dictador tweets and 6% of What a Lovely Dictatorship posts came from accounts that were deactivated within a month, which is a signal that Twitter itself found these users suspicious. A uh, disproportionate number of accounts were created very recently, another signal of inauthentic activity, since starting new accounts is the cheapest way to replace those that were removed. But overshadowing this is a spike in the creation of pro-government accounts the week that Bukele took office. So hundreds of new pro-Bukele accounts were created in the course of just a couple of days. 
And this is really suspicious. We would expect a much smoother bump in accounts created if this were about joining to champion Bukele or about other important events like Bukele's election or military occupation of the legislature don't come with that same bump. In one day, more accounts were created than in the entire previous month that used this, this pro-Bukele hashtag. And what this suggests is the building of a network of pro-government accounts that are designed to boost the messaging of the administration. What we're seeing is obviously not unique to El Salvador. We're seeing the government use Twitter as a tool to inflame and polarize and simplify political debate in El Salvador and exacerbating these trends in offline contact, uh, in offline conflict. But this has very real consequences for El Salvador's politics, both online and offline, in an area of kind of the greatest central importance to El Salvador, which is gang violence. Uh, how to maintain these reductions in gang violence is going to be one of the great policy challenges of the Bukele administration moving forward, and it will require broad buy-in and a sustainable policy that both addresses sources of conflict and respects human rights. And the polarized debate that we're seeing is not conducive to this kind of long-term solution for gang violence. So what we're seeing here is social media inflaming a pre-existing conflict to make it harder to solve offline violence. Uh, so I think that those are my, my comments for now. I'm looking forward to, to questions and I'll hand it back to Hugh. Thanks very much, Jane. Just a quick follow-up question. Uh, do you see much that uh, in, in countries like El Salvador that seems to have way, is there much that the EU can do to intervene to counter the violent agendas um, while at the same time supporting media freedom? Uh, and is what you saw in El Salvador typical for what uh, of all the other countries you've studied these phenomena in? Um, so on the on the EU question, I mean, this is obviously uh, a central difficulty in designing policy around these issues is that this is happening on uh, on an independent platform. So this is really about uh, pressuring companies to address the use of trolls and bots online. Right now, that's partially a really technical question. It's very hard to identify these kinds of accounts. And what you don't want to do is remove a bunch of users who are just using Twitter or Facebook in a way that you you don't recognize as normal. You know, often with the tools that we have to identify bots really uh, were built on Western audiences and were built on younger audiences. And so there, often you see uh, statistics about the number of followers of Bukele, for instance, who are bots or trolls. And that's probably a pretty large overestimate because the users that follow him might be just using Twitter in a way that we don't understand, using a lot of retweets, not posting a lot of original content. But I think that uh, that what we can do is look at, at kind of ways of supporting and boosting voices that are much more moderate, uh, helping civil society to more effectively use social media and to and obviously there are uh, there's a great debate over algorithmic changes in the in content about the degree to which the algorithms that the run Twitter, Facebook, these social media platforms artificially boost controversial policies and automatically kind of push them further afront to the front. There's also, and I touched on this less, there have been pretty sustained attacks on the critics of Bukele from uh, a variety of, of high-level politicians, and often this is very gendered. Uh, sometimes this involves doxing. Uh, attacks like that that are very direct and that are coming from a wide network, I think, can be more actively, uh, actively suppressed and dealt with more quickly. Uh, because they often arise very, very fast and having networks and, and the ability to, for platforms to be able to address those quickly as they come up will require the cooperation of civil society, of governments, of people tracking them, greater moderation, all of the things that we talk about quite often and we'll hear again and again during this uh, these talks. Um, on, uh, I'm sorry, what was your second question, Hugh? Uh, just how typical is what you saw in El Salvador to the phenomenon you've studied elsewhere? I think this is very typical. I think uh, it varies by government, the degree to which they have access to these things like troll farms. Latin America um, has been, there have been a lot of cases where, where governments and opposition have been accused of using troll farms. But if you pay close attention to kind of any controversial topic, you'll see certain um, kind of markers of inauthentic activity, like the reposting of the same message again and again and again. We see this in both Western countries and the global South. 
Um, so I think it's very common and very indicative. I think that the, the difference in El Salvador is that it's touching on, on this area of gang violence that in an ideal world should be uh, nonpartisan and that should be focused on really solving for, for long-term solutions and that should not have this kind of vitriol and attacks from both sides uh, really, uh, really kind of dominating the online sphere. Um, but I do think that it is unfortunately pretty common that the degree to which it affects politics, I think, varies quite a bit. Sometimes you see these um, these messages being boosted uh, in a way that does not necessarily reach real users. You don't see a lot of engagement. There's a fair amount of engagement with these posts in El Salvador, in part because this has been a focus of Bukele's administration. That on, you know, social media is central to his government and central to his popularity in a way that he recognizes and the opposition recognizes. Thanks very much, Jane. Okay, uh, we're now going to turn to Anita Godis, but um, can I suggest that the colleagues put the next Slido poll on so we can have that on while I introduce her, which will be asking about what the EU can do uh, in the audience's mind about the social media problems that we've got. Um, and while I hope we'll be able to get that on, um, but meanwhile, um, our, our second speaker, um, is Anita Godes, who's uh, a professor of international and cybersecurity at the Hertie School in Berlin. Uh, her research focuses on contentious policies in the cyber, cyber realm, especially on large scale quantitative analysis of state behavior. Um, previously, she was assistant professor of international relations at the University of Zurich. And since 2009, she has worked for the California based nonprofit organization Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Uh, she currently advises the German Federal Foreign Office and has consulted for the World Bank and the United Nations on security and state fragility. And uh, just before you start in, Anita, um, let, let's, have a, let's let everyone try and answer this. We have 10 replies. Let's leave that going and uh, perhaps we'll just uh, we'll start listening to uh, Anita because I'm going to ask the same question to you. Um, We've heard what Jane said about the, the, the government in, in El Salvador and the, the board, more broadly in Latin America. Um, and uh, we've seen monitoring and limiting of opposition communication at capacity, spreading their own messages. messages. What, from your perspective, do you think is the most important impact this has on conflict? Thank you, Hugh. Yeah, so I'd like to um, give a slightly broader perspective on how governments make use of social media in conflict and in situations of general political unrest. Um, so I think what's interesting, and in this um, fits with what uh, Jane was saying at the end of her presentation, that we see that uh, this strategy is something that is being pursued both by democratic and non-democratic governments. So we see this being used in you know, Western democracies, but also in many authoritarian countries. Um, and this indicates the importance of engaging with online discourse in context with both high and low levels of traditional media freedom. So I think we sometimes have this traditional idea, relatively traditional idea that um, it's going to be more important to engage uh, on social media in cases where um, the, the traditional uh, media environment is more or less free, but we actually see governments doing it in both of these contexts. And so I think that is a, an important indication that the, the, the digital sphere really can't be ignored, regardless of what the rest of your media um, situation looks like. In terms of the actions that we see being used, I think it's useful to distinguish between direct actions by governments, for example, through their own accounts where they identify themselves, their official accounts, and then indirect actions, for example, by semi-governmental groups or just groups that are in support of um, the government and might not even be paid. And so I think there's, there's quite a big distinction there. In a global study looking at the official accounts from governments themselves, so heads of state and heads of government together with colleagues, we looked at this direct social media engagement. And one of the things we find, again, across democracies and non-democracies, is that these official government accounts are oftentimes used to divert attention away from political unrest. So in the context of political unrest, so protest um, moving towards um, broader um, contentious events such as um, such as riots or, or actually moving towards uh, armed conflict, we see that this is coincides with diversion on the official channels of, uh, of the government. And so I think that's quite interesting because we'll oftentimes find that government supporting groups or semi-governmental groups will directly engage with contentious events while the official accounts are kind of trying to divert attention away. When it comes to these um, 
these semi-governmental groups, we see diversion, we see this cheerleading that Jane was talking about, um, but we also see direct threaten, uh, threatening uh, actions and attacks against uh, supporters of the opposition in a more aggressive way. So this is one way where we see direct social media engagement by state actors and semi-state actors, but we also see um, social media being used to monitor or the activity of opposition groups. And I think an important part, point here that is oftentimes forgotten is that it's not only about members of the opposition or critics of the government within the country we're talking about, but it's also oftentimes the diaspora. And so I think this is opening up a new dimension of both surveillance and repression that is transnational and that we still have relatively limited evidence and, and, and work on. So I think this is really something we need more more evidence on. The third is a little bit more meta in the comment that I want to make here, and that is that we're increasingly seeing governments appropriating the so-called fake news discourse and the need for content moderation for their own advantages. And so I've been studying censorship now for a long time, and we saw about 10 years, 15 years ago, that a lot of governments were kind of covertly using censorship. And we've kind of now seen this move towards being much more overt and much more kind of, um, um, uh, um, how would we say, self-confident in the use of censorship strategies because they very nicely dovetail onto this idea of we need to moderate content. Um, social media is principally inciting violence and, and this might actually um, mean that we have a, a very clear um, clear reason to, um, to curb disinformation through censorship. And so I think this, uh, this is a very delicate balance um, that uh, that a lot of um, governments that are caught within conflict within their own countries are now abusing. Thanks very much, Anita. Uh, since we have a, a very Europe Europe focused audience today, do you think you could also have a have a go at answering that question about is, is there more that the EU could do about it? We have fifty four percent of our of our audience thinks that the EU could do more. If 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 that was to be the case, what what can what can happen? Well, yes, I think we can. And I, uh, coming from a European institution myself and, and being based in Berlin, um, I think the discussion around hate speech, the regulation of hate speech, uh, fake news, uh, disinformation on, on, on social media um, is a very important one that we're currently having. And, and the EU, I think, is one of the kind of pioneers is when it comes to, to, to regulating these different types of, of content. But I think we really have to take into account the unintended consequences of this discourse when it comes to providing opportunistic discourse to other actors that might say, well, you know, what we're seeing at the moment is fake news and this is, you know, the potential to incite harm. And so what we're actually doing here in terms of shutting down the internet, in terms of shutting down social media is actually promoting peace. So I think I think taking care of this, uh, or being aware of these unintended consequences is very important for our policymakers as well. Mm -hmm. um, the second point I think that is really important is, is thinking more about how we can promote transparency within social media companies. So there's been a lot of discussion about how social media companies are principally listening to policymakers in Europe and North America. And so I think um, promoting transparency when it comes to how social media companies comply with requests for takedown of content, for example, in conflict uh, affected regions is something that we can do within, within the EU as well. We're seeing a lot of content not only being taken down, but downgraded in terms of the algorithm, so fewer people see it. Um, if we think of apps such as TikTok, they don't even have to necessarily delete the content, just fewer people get to see it. We talk about shadow banning. So I think all of these things require more transparency, and this is something where European regulators really have um, a lot of um, a lot of potential. And then just briefly, I was struck why you you know, you, you, you have an overview of, of, of the whole scene. Is social media censorship and all these issues being with censorship has been with us since Roman times? I mean, the, you know, what is different about social media that uh, makes it so special that we should organise uh, panels about it? So one of the comparisons I think is re that's really interesting is thinking about traditional surveillance infrastructure. So a lot of states have surveillance infrastructure for you know, nefarious reasons or for good reasons. Um, but that infrastructure is usually in the olden times. It was traditionally built for one single purpose, and that was to provide information to the state. When we think about how social media works as a form of a surveillance infrastructure, it is very much dependent on people adopting it um, themselves. And so it's a, it's a very different type of uh, infrastructure that we're talking about. And it's actually much less costly for states to exploit, if you think about it, because people are very excited to use it. 
Um, and so that brings with it a lot of advantages for states. You know, they can access new members of the population. They can access new regions where they usually weren't able to access information. On the other hand, it's now also democratizing information. So that information is not only being collected for the governments themselves, but it's being weaponized by non-state groups as well. And so it, it creates these new interesting trade-offs. And it's one of the reasons why we're seeing states being so dynamic in their censorship policies. They'll censor, uncensor the internet, block, unblock social media, because sometimes it's an advantage and sometimes it's a disadvantage. Great. Thanks very much, Anita. I'm sure we'll be coming back to these topics. And um, just for those who didn't see the, the result of the poll, do you think the EU is doing enough to influence state actors and prevent harmful <coughs> agendas being spread? 54% said the EU could do more, 25% had no opinion, and 21% said the EU cannot be a decisive player. So thanks for putting that all up. And now we'll move on to Tom Keane, who knows all about... Uh, uh, social media blockages and on-off and uh, some uh, and things because he's going to talk to us about Myanmar. He's a Tom is a, a crisis group consultant on Myanmar and Bangladesh, uh, and has contributed to uh, extraordinarily vivid briefings and reports on topics ranging from the Rohingya crisis to the peace process uh, to, of course, the latest uh, dramas uh, after the coup in in Myanmar. Uh, outside of his ICG work, he's a journalist and editor who has been working in Myanmar for the past 13 years, since uh, January 2008. He edited the English edition of the Myanmar Times for six years before joining the web platform Frontier Myanmar. So welcome to you, Tom. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining us uh, from, from, from there. Uh, I think in Myanmar, we, we clearly saw the, the government trying to use the social media to its advantage. Um, uh, initially, uh, before the coup, and now it is um, uh, using it uh, as probably a fairly blunt uh, instrument. Can you tell us more about the uh, how how this is working and uh, how it's affecting the conflict in in, in your country? Yeah, thanks, you. Yeah, I, it's really important when we look at social media and conflict in Myanmar. Um, to think about it in terms of uh, BC and AC, that is before the coup and after the coup. Um, I say this because the military takeover has really shifted the conflict dynamics so much over the past four and a half months, and that's been reflected on social media. So before February 1, we had two competing centers of state power, the NLD and the, the Tatmadaw, as Myanmar's military is known. Um, and while they're in competition with each other at a national political level, uh, in elections and so on, when it came to most of the country's armed conflicts, for example, with the Rohingya, uh, which we, which Jane mentioned earlier, and, and also the Rakhine, the Arakan army, uh, they were largely on the same page. Um, but now they're competing on the battlefield and in the streets rather than in the corridors of power. The National Unity Government, uh, which is the parallel administration formed by the opposition since the coup, is, is trying to ally with ethnic armed groups, ethnic minorities more broadly. Um, so their messaging and policies are quite different from uh, those of the NLD prior to the coup. They're much more conciliatory. Uh, they've promised a genuine federal democracy, um, which is something that minorities have been uh, striving for for decades, and also to the Rohingya specifically, um, citizenship and, and reform of the citizenship law. So this political shift has dramatically changed the discourse on, on social media in Myanmar. Um, although there's still uh, a lot of suspicion uh, on all sides, um, you know, f uh, suspicion of the NUG uh, from minorities, for example, uh, the anger at the Tatmadaw since the coup has had a, a unifying effect. Um, and it has really left very little space for pro-military voices on social media, particularly um, Facebook. The other um, important change we've seen since the coup, and this is probably something that um, that many of you have heard about, is the platforming of the Myanmar military. Um, Facebook banned the Tatmadaw in late February, along uh, with state media outlets that were now under um, military control. And other platforms like YouTube um, have also taken similar steps. Facebook has also been getting much better over the years at removing um, military proxies uh, from its platform. And the, the ban uh, in February has made this easier from a regulatory point of view. Um, and so the military has really been relegated to, to fringe platforms. Um, 
so the equation for the Tatmadaw now is uh, public sentiment is overwhelmingly against it. And then it no longer has uh, any official voice on many of these platforms. Uh, even its proxies are having uh, trouble getting a foothold. So this has limited its ability to even reach its own supporters. Um, and the response has been to go into damage control. It can't win the social media war. Uh, it wants to at least try to stop its opponents from using social media to their advantage. So first we saw uh, it blocked Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, then it began trying to restrict access to VPNs that people were using uh, successfully to access these platforms after they'd been banned. Um, when that didn't really work, it shut down uh, mobile internet. Um, and it also began prosecuting people for social media posts just to make people uh, too scared really to, to speak out. Um, this has had some impact. So social media was being used very successfully to organize protests and create a sense of solidarity between opposition groups. Um, the mobile data shutdown disrupted some of that momentum because it left many people, particularly in rural areas, without any internet at all. Um, this obviously made it hard to organize protests. Um, we can also see from monitoring of um, popular Facebook groups and pages that after the mobile shutdown, interaction levels um, might have fallen by as much as uh, 70%. Uh, so that gives you a sense of, of the impact of the shutdown. But I think one important factor um, that is driving the military's actions that, that we sometimes don't think about or overlook is the desire to limit access to information um, among its own supporters, particularly um, uh, soldiers and their families. So without access to social media, their only source of information often is state media, uh, which they're forced to watch. So um, that's that's something that we often don't think about. Uh, there are many kind of factors driving uh, the internet shutdown in Myanmar. But of course, shutting down the internet comes with uh, significant costs as well. Um, on the question of how the EU can use its influence, um, I've got a, a couple of quick suggestions. Um, I, I think it is important to note that the hate speech dynamic has really shifted and, and we should be taking that on board. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a very different uh, attitude, tone towards ethnic minorities, but most notably the Rohingya, um, who have been the target of, of a lot of hate speech in recent years, uh, particularly in 2017 and 2018. Um, we should be cautious about this development because the, the prejudices are very deep seated. They're still there in a lot of respects could be reactivated quite easily but it really is an important trend and we should be thinking about how it can be supported and strengthened um, at the same time though new targets of hate speech are emerging and, and these are really difficult issues um, for example uh, there are underground groups that are assassinating civilians who are perceived as pro-military and these deaths are often being celebrated on social media by many people um, such as the kind of the toxic, uh, you know, uh, or the level of anger towards the military. So the space for neutrality is, is really small now and forms of hate speech are present on, on both sides. Um, another priority I think should be protecting social media users. And one way to do that is to limit the military's access to what you might call the digital tools of repression. Uh, security forces are certainly trying to improve their use of technology to monitor opponents in real time and also to gather information from seized devices to unravel, you know, anti-military networks and opposition groups. Um, but European companies have exported equipment to the security forces that could be used for this purpose um, in the past. So tighter restrictions are important. And just finally, um, before the coup, the LD, I think, was it's fair to say part of the problem when it came to freedom of expression and digital rights. It prosecuted social media users, it shut down the internet in Rakhine State, um, and pushed mobile operators to hand over user data. And often it was doing this at the request of the military, but it still went along uh, with the military's requests. Now the military is doing exactly the same thing to the opposition, including the NUG. So there's an opportunity to support opposition groups to develop um, and put forward alternative frameworks on freedom of expression and social media use and internet access that really stands in contrast to what the Tatmadaw is doing now and what has happened in the past in Myanmar. So although the NUG um, wouldn't have a way of implementing that right now, it, it's a parallel government, it's, it's not in power, um, it would be a very powerful statement that could be built upon in the future depending on how events unfold in Myanmar.
Thanks very much, uh, Tom. That that uh, that's really comprehensive. You you talk about what the you could do in the future. Um, have, uh, Myanmar seems an awfully long way away from Europe. Uh, can you give us some examples of? what the EU has done in this domain that have really made changes in the past? Uh, in regard to social media use? Yes, if, the, if, if there is such a thing. I mean, it, uh, has that been a, a salient issue up to now? Well, I, I think that, I don't want to single out the EU. I mean, I think uh, on digital rights more broadly, um, there were, it, it was hasn't been a priority in the past in Myanmar. And you had, um, uh, different states and donors, for example, engaging with the NLD government on issues and and not really uh, taking into account how some of the um, programs that they were participating in with the government might have a negative effect on digital rights and on the, the safety of um, uh, social media users, for example. Um, on the, the, so I think that's something that needs to be taken on board in future. I mean, there's not a lot of prospect for cooperation with the military um, regime, uh, bilateral cooperation, but, but but still I think that that was an area where um, there, you know, that, that more could have been done in the past and, and the coup has really highlighted the importance of that, I think. Um, the other thing, the, the EU has um, taken some steps to, to restrict um, the export of uh, equipment that could be used um, to violate human rights. And there's still um, sort of ongoing, uh, an ongoing process there to strengthen that. So I think that's positive um, and, and more states need to follow suit, uh, particularly when it, when it comes to Myanmar. Thanks, Tom. And thanks again for joining us. It's very late where you are uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. Um, no problem. Thanks. And now we're going to turn to uh, Alessandro Accorsi, uh, who is head of the Strategic Communications Task Force South at the European External Action Service, um, working in fact-based communication, countering disinformation, narrative positioning, and the strengthening of the overall media environment and civil society. Um, and prior to working at the EEAS, Alessandro was a freelance journalist based in the United Kingdom and Egypt. Um, Alessandro, you saw that in the poll that uh, a, a slight majority of our, of our audience felt that the EU uh, could do more. Um, and you are obviously uh, not a government yourself, but you have a great uh, uh, influence on, on what happens. Um, how do you see governments actively working to use social media to their advantage, uh, either by monitoring or limiting the opposition's communications capacities or spreading their own messages? Is that something the, the EU does? And uh, is that desirable? And how does that uh, affect conflict? Uh, thanks for, for the question. My team works specifically, and, and thanks also for those uh, for the poll, actually. Uh, if you have suggestions, I, I very much welcome them because they, they make my job easier. It's, it's not easy at all. Um, but my work, my team works uh, specifically on the MANA region, on the Middle East and, uh, and North Africa. Um, and so um, Jane mentioned in the opening video that the Arab Spring was called the Twitter Revolution. And in the past uh, decade, we can say that we've seen the Twitter Counter Revolution happening and unfolding in, in the region. Um, and, and, and you see, uh, you can clearly see how governments realize that their old approach to propaganda, to internet shutdowns, uh, was wrong. Um, not only because it was ineffective, uh, but because they failed to understand that um, social media could be weaponized, as Anita also mentioned, uh, it could be used at their, at their own advantage. And, um, and also that it's, it's actually a cheap tool to, to develop. It's something that you can, uh, you can develop in a, in a kind of a cheap way. It's not, a, it's not expensive. Is that me or has Alessandro frozen? Sorry about this. We will hope to rejoin him in a second because he can, yes, we have a confirmation that Alessandro has frozen for the time being. Let's, let's hope to, to bring him back um, in a second. But uh, in the meantime, um, perhaps, uh, perhaps we could go back to Jane if you're, if you're there until um, we will 
return to Alessandro as soon as he's back. Um, can you can you give us some uh, reflections on what you think? Um, uh, uh, what in what way the online opinions in El Salvador are reflecting our reflection of uh, of uh, conflict and security policy versus being a driver of them? Where where would you put the the role of uh, social media in this? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the question of whether social media drives or reflects conflict is one that we're grappling with as, as academics and practitioners across a variety of contexts. Um, in El Salvador, what we're seeing is, is it being used very strategically as an exacerbator, right? This is not a passive role for social media. This is a very active role, a very strategic and top-driven role, which means that similarly it could be uh, could be addressed through top-level policies. If Bukele and the opposition chose to stop using such divisive language online, it could reflect itself in how people view the administration, especially because of the central importance of Twitter in addressing, uh, in, in kind of propagating these conflicts. Um, I'm going to keep it short because I think Alessandro, uh, Alessandro is back, so I, I'll, I'll hand it over back to him. Thanks for that, Jane. Yes, back to you, Alessandro. Sorry, we lost you just briefly. I'm very sorry about that. that that's what happens when you're not working from home, but from the office, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should have worked from home today um no uh what i was saying is that yeah like technology really uh made it easier for state and non-state actors in the region to develop capabilities to use social media at their own advantage um and the re the syrian regime was probably among the first ones to understand that uh, they looked at the examples of tunisia of egypt of libya and understood that internet shutdowns were, were wasn't enough uh when people mobilize online then that mobilization online translated to the offline as, as soon as you uh, shut it off the internet. Um, but they understood that they could use it to their advantage. What's quite interesting is the way they did it from the start, because it's also something that is very different from all the other cases in the region. Uh, they were quick to jump from propaganda to disinformation, but instead of trying to only control their own information space, of course, they had an electronic army that was active in trolling, hacking, uh, silencing of positions with techniques that now most actors in the region use. Um, while they were trying to do that, they also tried to impose a narrative. Um, a, a narrative that was so in doubt in, uh, in not only in Syrian audiences, but also in international audiences. This was the new thing, and that was diff what was diff what is different about Syria compared to other uh, cases in the region. Um, they immediately started um, spreading rumors about the fact that the, there was no uprising; it was a foreign conspiracy, uh, that it was just a group of terrorists that were actually uh, trying to take over the country. And most of all, they managed to strike an unlikely coalition, an alliance with. Um, anti-imperialist, like around the anti-imperialist uh, narrative uh, with uh, both far-right groups and far-left groups in, uh, in, in the West. Of course, like when um, Russia was involved, it gave a big boost to this because it brought new uh, technologies, it brought new uh, understanding of how to do this. And, and, and you can see that, that actually uh, the, the Syrian disinformation techniques is basically in the hands of, uh, mostly in the hands of Russia, follows the, the model of Russia. Uh, but it's very interesting that Syrian disinformation is highly internationalized. It's not in, this, in the hands of Syrians anymore. Um, think of when was the last time that you heard a Syrian speak about Syria, uh, or when, or where is the, the Syrian narrative around uh, the crisis and the conflict? It's all been taken away from Syrian hands, and it's something that is highly internationalized so that Syrians do not, uh, are not the producers and consumers of this information. Of course, they're also subject to this information and misinformation, uh, but they're not the ones who actually um, are, um, they're the passive uh, uh, beneficiaries, let's say, of, uh, of that disinformation because it falls on them. So uh, the main objective of this information in this case was that, um, was to prevent others from implementing policy. Um, so by creating, by sowing doubt about what was happening in, in Syria, uh, by sowing doubt about the reasons for intervening or not intervening in, in, in Syria, about who was right, who, uh, what was happening on the ground, who was responsible for 
things. Uh, they managed to, on one side, create space for uh, the regime and its allies to implement certain policies and even uh, chemical attacks. Uh, and on the other side, uh, prevent others from, from implementing policies on Syria. And we see this uh, happening all the time. Uh, think of the chemical attacks. Uh, think uh, of the fact that the war is now presented as being over, as uh, Syria is a peaceful country uh, where there is no fighting, where everyone is fine, where everything is, uh, is, is shiny and, uh, and people can just go back. Um, when we know that it's not the case, uh, last year there were protests and there were immediately um, all the videos of the protests were immediately taken down by uh, organized groups uh, linked to the Syrian state that um, filed copyright infringements on YouTube or um, mass reported uh, Twitter accounts or Facebook groups. So they're still trying to control the merging of another narrative, but at the same time, they managed to uh, create an international narrative that uh, not only divides the, any opposition, but also reduces the policy options available to make any real solution to the conflict, um, they make any, any real solution to the conflict harder to achieve. Um, while at the same day, at the same time, they, they continue to silence, to, uh, to operate uh, as they do. So that's, uh, that's the main uh, issue with, uh, with, uh, with the Syrian conflict. It's, it's a conflict that is uh, already complicated enough, uh, politically, militarily, etc but uh, where this information created an extra layer of difficulty uh, that helped uh, the Syrian regime actually stay in place. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Um, since, since you are kindly joining us from the EU and since everyone always is asking, oh, please, EU, please uh, solve this for us. Can you give us an idea relating to Syria and especially Syrian social media? You've analyzed the situation. You've given us great observations. But what do you think that the EU can do and what has it done to try and uh, mi mitigate all these uh, rather uh, dreadful um, developments you've described? Uh, yes. Yeah, so... Um Let's say that um, my job is quite complicated, I have to say, and, and that of my team is even further complicated, uh, as you can imagine. But uh, we cover a region that, uh, that is uh, full of conflicts, and full of uh, active and inactive conflicts, uh, full of tensions. Um, what is most complicated about our region is that um, every country is a different information environment. But then overall, you have also an overall information environment, regional information environment, given by the Arabic context. So what we do specifically in my team is try to um, come up with tailored strategies that are country by country and look at uh, all the, the possible weak, uh, weaknesses of that information environment and what needs to, to be strengthened. Uh, it can be uh, supporting independent media, it can be supporting civil society, it can be um, political pressure to have a better legislative framework, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, now, uh, our main pillars of work is to, and, and this is true to all the cases, not only on Syria, is first of all, we need to understand what is happening uh, because there's very little literature on what's happening and what's going on. In in, in the region. This is something I appreciated about the, the panel today, is that uh, a lot of times we talk about Russia, we talk about China, um, but it's very hard to know actually what's going on in, in Myanmar or, well, Myanmar is, 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 has, been, has been covered, but, uh, but it's interesting and all El Salvador and, and Latin America. Um, so what we're doing is trying to understand what is happening and make sure that our policy colleagues have an informed understanding of what is going on. That's the, the first point for us. Um, because wars are now fought in the information environment, um, but also because of what uh, Anita said before about the unintended consequences. The EU is trying to regulate um, the, the problem, let's say, of social media uh, in inside the EU, of course. Uh, but that also means that uh, this can have unintended consequences outside. Uh, think, for example, of whether uh, we would push for banning all anonymous accounts online uh, so that only uh, every account in, in the world on social media needs to be linked to uh, any form of ID or cell phone or something. That would mean basically that thousands of millions or of, uh, of users would be exposed to regimes that could uh, easily arrest them. Uh, activists would not be able to operate. At the same time, we need to find a balance between 
uh, basically supporting that and also uh, understanding, uh, pushing the, 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 the social media platforms to do more. Uh, then what we also do, and this is something that we do specifically on Syria, because the main problem in Syria is that the information limits the space for uh, policy action. Uh, what we do is that we try to uh, use strategic communication not as communication for the sake of communication, but use it uh, to maintain a space through factual information for EU policy action. Uh, to make sure that uh, there is space for uh, for policy action uh, by UNHCR, by the UN, by the EU, etc., uh, to try and achieve a political solution in line with uh, UN Security Resolution 2254. Um, and then uh, last pillar for us, and the most important, I would say, is, the, is that um, our objective is not to um, limit or um, I mean, we need to maintain this balance between limiting uh, information operations and uh, freedom of expression. And freedom of expression for us always wins. Um, the, the problem is trying to limit the, the manipulative um, uh, behavior on social media. And so what we're looking at is improve the overall quality of the information environments in the region by working with and empowering civil society. Uh, which uh, in the region was the one that actually started, you know, the digital revolution, but as the, is the one that uh, that was uh, most uh, 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 um, hated by by the counter revolution. Um, support independent media, uh, not only financially but also uh, by understanding that their presence in their existence is part of an institution building process. Um, if independent media in the region is gone. Um, we would need to start a, a new institution building process that would take us uh, 30 or 40 years to get to the point where we are today. Uh, and then last point is uh, ensure that there are fair rules to the game for everyone. Um, we are not saying that some actors uh, like that we want to be the ones that take advantage of this. And uh, no, if, we, if we're not good at communicating ourselves or if we're not good, good at implementing certain policies, uh, then it's up for audiences and for the public to decide, you know, if they, if they like it or not. But what, what is important is that there are fair rules to the game for everyone. And this is done through uh, improving the legal environment for media, uh, opening up space for independent media, uh, reduce foreign manipulation and also working with uh, the platforms as was mentioned by by the other speakers um, both to keep them accountable but also to make sure that they work with uh, civil society push them to be more transparent to apply the rules but also to work more with uh, with local civil society uh, platforms of, often lament that they do not have counterparts in the civil society in the region uh, that they can only work with governments or that cannot work with anyone uh, and what we're trying to do is try to empower civil society and and really balance this triangle of power between governments uh, social media platforms and civil society thank you alessandro that's a, a really clear um uh, layout of what the eu can is actually doing and I, I really appreciated that and you actually answered one of our first questions on slido uh, I can see other questions coming in. We're sorting them out and, and, and showing them on the screen. Um, so please do keep uh, uh, submitting the questions and you can also open, uh, vote up the questions. So if you just click on the thumbs up there, it will, it will push the question further towards the top. And uh, you've answered one, Alessandro, and I will just quickly send you the other one. Uh, you've said that you support civil society. Uh, the specific question from the audience is, does the EU fund civil society projects in the global south more generally to monitor and help expose these kinds of abuses on social media? Um, yes, uh, I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, we, we do actually support uh, civil society organizations and experts working on this, um, both in terms of independent media, uh, fact checkers uh, and others. Uh, and now we're working actually to, uh, one of the things we do is uh, we're trying to uh, work on tailored projects that would cover the, the needs of each country. Because as I said, we, uh, we cover in my team at least 19 countries plus the regional environment. Um, and so that, was, that is what complicates a little bit our job. Um, we need to, um, to, to, to tailor these programs to the needs of each country. So in, in some cases, 
uh, exposure of this information works best. Uh, in other cases, it's more that what is needed is more independent media. In other cases, it's more um, uh, digital security or uh, helping independent voices be heard, also mainstream media, uh, limit uh, for interventions, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And uh, just one last question from you, from the audience, Alessandro. Uh, you, you mentioned a bit about the strategic communications as kind of rebalance the playing field of uh, and not allowing people to get away with saying the war was over. But can you just quickly tell us what the strategic communications for Syria that you are trying to promote uh, is in, the, in a nutshell? Um, in a nutshell, it's a little bit complicated, but basically, uh, as a said, we're not doing communication for the sake of communication. We're trying to uh, do communication to create space for EU policy uh, initiatives. And our EU policy in, in, on Syria is, is pretty clear. It's in line with the UN Security Resolution 2254 that says that the future of Syria is for Syrians to decide. Um, so what we've been doing on several things, uh, there are two main uh, periods, let's say, uh, on one side, we've been working with Syrians themselves, uh, with filmmakers, with uh, civil society, with uh, media, uh, to help them tell their own story and 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 give voice to to their narrative. Um, because, as I said before, in this highly internationalized information environment, uh, there are not many um, Syrian voices that are heard. So we've been trying to to give voice to to Syrians using the EU as a platform, and this is one thing. Uh, and the second thing is trying to uh, address and expose this information uh, when it can, when it concerns directly the EU or when it could be potentially harmful. Uh, for example, on returns of refugees, because we've seen that uh, people um, might have wanted to uh, Syrians might have wanted to go back or. or People could think that uh, Syria was safe for, for returns when we know that uh, people are scared to go back because they could be arrested, they could be forced or scripted in the army, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, the same also on something that concerns more the EU on European uh, Union sanctions uh, against the Syrian regime. Uh, that uh, the Syrian regime claims are that, that we are conduct conducting a, an economic war uh, against the Syrian people, but uh, Sanctions have been in place since 2011 for a reason, and that's because uh, the Syrian regime has used the money to uh, repress their own people and, and and keeps taking money away from the Syrian people to repress their own uh, their own people. Uh, so we've and we never had a problem, or we never had this information around this uh, until the the economic crisis hit in, in Syria, and suddenly basically the regime tried to shift blame on on, on us. So we just wanted to set the record straight there and and explain. Uh, a little bit why we are why we believe that sanctions need to be placed because the conditions for uh, political change in the country have not uh, have not changed. Thanks, Alessandro. Um, for the next question, I think well, I'll put it to two two of us. But if we could perhaps start with Tom Keane in Myanmar because uh, he's right on the front line of this. Uh, what what Tom do you find to have been the most efficient tool against disinformation? Is it either national or international intervention or regulation? Or is it ad hoc taken uh, action taken by the social media platforms themselves? Yeah, I think um, my experience in Myanmar would suggest um, it needs to be a combination of, of different factors. Um, yes, um, social media platforms are really important. I mean, we saw uh, in 2017 and 2018 um, when Facebook uh, was not... Um, uh, policing content um, closely enough, uh, the influence that that could have. I mean, there was an explosion of hate speech towards the Rohingya. Um, but uh, I think, you know, as as we've discussed, I mean, independent media that's um, based in the country um, can, can play a really helpful role in combating disinformation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's really a combination of, of factors. Um, but you know, we do often have to be wary of um, the way that, that governments will use this issue to, to introduce laws um, to prosecute social media users. I mean, in, in Myanmar, just in the past four months, um, two laws have, have been amended um, to introduce the penalty of, uh, sorry, the crime of um, spreading false information or false news. And these are these are being used now against um, hundreds, maybe even more than a thousand um, people so far. So um, that's kind of the flip side of 
um, you know, uh, trying to of inter but I'm quite intervention um, to tackle this information that we need to be careful of. Thanks, Tom and Anita. Can I call on you to come in and uh, give us your overview of what you think uh, works best? Is it the social media platform action or the regulation and intervention by outsiders, uh, especially governments? I think one of the uh, the things research has taught us is that the uh, the effectiveness of these different tools is highly context dependent. Um, so I think the the and this is something that of course academics like to say. But um, but I think Tom Thomas's point about um, about the fact that um, initially there was kind of under policing, if you could say, of um, of posts in, in Myanmar um, uh, being tied to the fact that um, there was just very little cult cultural and, and contextual knowledge within Facebook to deal with those uh, with those posts. And so I think one of the things that um, that research does show. Um, um, that has a positive effect here is increasing the kind of capacity both within companies, but then also the interplay with uh, between uh, between companies and civil society, as uh, as Alessandra was uh, was talking about. There's a lot of research right now looking at the ways in which um, flagging, for example, on platforms themselves related to possible disinformation might be effective or not. Um, my sense of the the current research there is that the results are very mixed. So. Um, there are instances in which flagging can draw attention to disinformation um, instead of kind of alerting uh, individuals to the fact that this might be um, disinformation. Um, and so I think uh, the, the one size fits all solution is still something that we're, um, that we're waiting for. But in general, the, 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 the strong need for contextual knowledge by members of uh, social media companies, having local offices, um, having clear communication with uh, with various civil society groups that can quickly alert um, the companies um, is is very very important. I need to wonder what you want. I mean, that that's about disinformation. There's also something else you've worked on uh, and written about, which is the question of the actual technology infrastructure and the 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 the, the internet backbone itself. And how have states used that? And how is how is how is that playing into conflicts? So one of the things that we that we find more broadly when looking at um, at the ownership, for example, of social, of uh, uh, internet service providers, is that the more centralized ownership is within countries, the easier it is, of course, for states or for governments themselves to control that uh, that infrastructure. And so there's a clear correlation with centralization of service provision of the internet and the ability to shut down the internet. And so that becomes a very very dangerous mix. Um, we also see that uh, that a lot of um, um, ISPs or internet service providers not, might not necessarily be um, owned by uh, by the state itself, but the state is able to exert a lot of pressure on those companies to still comply with their um, with their directives to shut down the internet. And so that has a big effect on the way in which um, political protest, for example, that plays out. Um, one of the things I found in my own work, also doing a lot of specific work on the Syrian context, is that. Um, in situations where the government decides to leave on the internet, allow people to use um, social media, for example, to communicate. Um, we find that in th those instances, even when we control for a whole host of other factors, repression tends to be more targeted. So we see more targeting of individuals, and we see clearer profiles of who's being, um, who's being um, basically uh, targeted by the state. The flip side of that is that where the government decides to shut down the internet, and I've done extensive work here both um, subnationally within Syria, nationally across time within Syria, but then also looking more globally at the role of internet outages. Um, in general, we find a very robust relationship between internet outages and an increase in state repression, regardless of what kind of um, country we're looking at. And so um, the, I think the the, the role that um, internet outages play in contentious politics is something that really deserves more attention. Thanks. So just to return to Tom on that question of outages, uh, you've you've experienced this directly. Uh, what, does the state get any benefit from it, and how how do people get around it? I mean, is it is it a solution for states to just shut things down? Well, I. It depends on your objectives. I mean, um, I think when in, in the case of Myanmar, I mean, when uh, establishing control and consolidating power is the 
the only um, real objectives that counts for the country's leaders, then an internet shutdown is, um, they will see it as justified and, um, and necessary. But it does have huge costs. I think we've seen this in Myanmar, I mean, um, social and economic. And uh, after a period, I think, in Myanmar, there was a, a realization um, that, that keeping the internet off forever for most people was not um, sustainable. And so the government, the military rather, has um, moved towards um, whitelisting of um, uh, a number of services so that, you know, now, for example, using mobile data, you can, um, you can access uh, uh, Gmail, um, you can access Office 365, you can access mobile banking and so on. Um, and I think that they thought this would be a solution. Um, you know, you might call it an intranet or, or, or something like that, but uh, it's proved practically quite difficult um, because, uh, you know, they've whitelisted more than a thousand services or websites now and um, just the, the nature of, of how the internet works and um, cloud-based uh, servers and so on. Um, this has resulted in a huge number of IP addresses um, being, being whitelisted and so it's opened up loopholes to access the internet as well. Um, I don't want to give too much detail on that but um, you know I could have done this call from 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 my mobile phone if I wanted to do tonight. So um, you know it's very hard for a country with a like Myanmar with the amount of resources Myanmar has um, to to keep uh, in the internet off, yet offer um, the services that people in a modern economy um, and modern society need. Uh, that's the the challenge that the Myanmar, Myanmar military is uh, grappling with right now. Thank you, Tom. Um, technically, we were going to take a break now, but uh, since we have lost our guest Shelby Gosman, I'm afraid from the next um, from the next uh, session. Uh, I, I would. I'd like to just carry on, let this roll on for a few more minutes, uh, if 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 I may. Um, and, and to, since you're you're going to just uh, stay, with you, we'll have Alessandro and uh, and Jane with us for the next session. If we could take advantage of your presence once more, uh, could you also look at uh, the, this whole question of uh, the the, sort of the the the, the, the this heavy-handed approach, which seems to be uh, even we could say increased increasingly popular amongst in, in the in, in countries where we study conflicts. Uh, what, what would your response to, to to governments trying to do that be? What would you advise them to do? You mean the, the, the government shutting down? The yeah, yeah, well, uh, what, what, what are the negative consequences uh, of, of shutting it down? And obviously the, they feel that they're, they're blanketing out the, uh, the opposition, but uh, as Tom is pointing out, it's very difficult and there are, there are serious downsides, but perhaps you, you have more general conclusions to draw. Yes, I think there, um, there are a number of interesting developments um, that, are, that are happening in this space right now. Um, one of them being the, the clear trade-off that, that states are, or governments are facing in terms of um, uh, having access to information, monitoring social media, and then wanting to basically shut down all, all forms of communication. Um, I like to say that because we see the, the intense use of internet shutdowns and then actually an increase in internet shutdowns, Shutdowns, um, a very kind of brutal form of censorship um, when far more nuanced forms of censorship are available it is an indication that um, states are or governments are still oftentimes afraid of the kind of non-state opposition power um, that is drawn from social media. So I think um, when we kind of have this broad discussion between liberation and maybe repression technology, the fact that states are still afraid of non-state actors using social media is an indication that there is some kind of communicative power still still to be had from from social media, as we talked about alternative forms of accessing information um, and so on and so forth. I think one of the, the very um, uh, kind of um, worrisome developments that we're seeing right now is a trend towards nationalizing internet infrastructure. So if we think about Russia or if we think about Iran, the development of national intranets that are kind of supposed to provide um, access um, that is that is domestic in terms of the, the, the infrastructure that we're seeing. Um, this is basically um, uh, a situation where we're seeing a development of infrastructure that is fully um, capable of surveillance that would still allow those states to basically shut off access from the World Wide Web while maintaining 
um, the type of um, uh, services that Thomas was referring to in Myanmar. So for example, financial services or domestic email services and so on and so forth. And so when we're moving towards this nationalization of infrastructure, what's are called intranets, um, we're kind of moving towards a situation where there is no longer a trade-off between censorship and surveillance, where states are able to kind of do both at the same time. And so I think there is a real push towards this kind of, also sometimes called the Chinese model, um, that, um, that poses a real threat to, uh, to freedom of speech um, and media freedom more broadly. And not least you have to be China to make such an internet, because um, it's a pretty big undertaking, I understand. Anyway, th thanks very much to this uh, really enlightening first panel. Uh, I'm told that we do need to to uh, to move on now. So, uh, Anita and Tom, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, really appreciated uh, your, your your time and your insights. And uh, Alessandra and Jane, thanks for staying on for our next uh, next uh, uh, panel, which will be about the other side of the coin, the uh, the non-state actors and how they're they're they're, they're, they're using things. So. Thank you, and uh, we will join you again after the break.
Sandra, I'll be coming to you first. So. I'm ready. Hello again. Uh, you're back with the uh, International Crisis Group's uh, uh, panel on the use of social media by state and non-state actors. We've just spent the last hour talking about how the state actors are working in this domain. And now we're going to switch over to the non-state side. Um, we're also going to, uh, as, as I introduce Alessandro, uh, we have a fourth poll um, on the Slido function, which if you've just joined us, it's on the below the screen on the Crisis Group uh, 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 website page, uh, or you can go to slido.com and enter hashtag ICG, and you can uh, both uh, answer the polls there and um, the poll questions there, and uh, we will uh, also have uh, uh, some uh, questions after, after the panelists have, uh, have joined us. And we, on this panel, we have uh, Alessandro Corsi, Jane Esberg, and uh, Are Ntui joining us to talk about Syria, Venezuela, and, um, uh, and Cameroon, all from, uh, all from a perspective of the, um, of the uh, non-state actors. Uh, Alessandro, who will join us first, um, is the head of the Strategic Communications Task Force South at the European External Action Service, uh, covering, I believe, uh, uh, 19 countries, in, in, in mostly in MENA, and uh, his, his works on fact-based communication, countering disinformation, narrative positioning, and the strengthening of the overall media environment and civil society. Um, so, uh, Alessandro, you've told us about the state side of the social media picture and a, a very uh, uh, a great overview of what the EU is doing. Um, when, it turn, when you turn your attention to the non-state narratives in the area of your responsibility, uh, what, what are you seeing? What, what can you do? Uh, are you seeing a heightened role of expatriates, international networks, uh, or, or, and how impactful are non-state actors on, on what's going on in your area of responsibility? Um, I, I would say that there are two kinds of non-state actors in uh, in our region. Uh, on one side, I would put civil society. Um, that's for sure. Like the civil society activists, independent media, anyone who has an independent voice, actually, even researchers and analysts are part of the group. Um, and on the other side, I would put uh, malign non-state actors because we have quite a few in in the region. Uh, the interesting thing is, as I mentioned before, that this information allows for any organized group to actually develop capabilities of some sort of uh, using this information in a way or another. Uh, they can be more or less sophisticated, um, but the entry uh, point for like to use this information has been lowered and lowered over the years. So if you have some money, if you have uh, some resources and organization, uh, and sometimes if you have a sponsor, um, you can easily uh, use that kind of uh, techniques to to actually play this information game. Um, so when it comes to the malign state actors, uh, we've seen, for example, in, in some contexts like Libya, um, um, armed groups, militias, uh, political parties that have used this information uh, in, in as a way of, of continuing their political infighting or military infighting. At the beginning of the tribal offensive, for example, all the actors on the ground used uh, this information as a way of uh, even advancing by inches on the ground. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation that was uh, spread around uh, to confuse uh, the other militias to uh, to actually uh, play psychological operations, but also to foment hate speech, uh, hatred, polarization that made uh, any ceasefire uh, even harder to achieve. And the problem there was that every every little actor was, uh, had some capacity of, of doing so. Um, the other thing that happened that was uh, extremely worrying for us and what and that I would say it was even more worrying than the use of, uh, of information operations on the military side is the fact that um, anyone who didn't take a position was silenced and targeted. So all the civil society actors, all those independent 
voices who tried to make sense of what was going on, who were trying to even just give simple fact-based information. Uh, an independent journalist, analyst, uh, Libyan or non-Libyan, uh, was harassed to the point or threatened, blackmailed, uh, their data stolen, uh, threats to them, to their families, uh, to the point that they basically gave up on, on engaging on social media uh, and that left the whole basically so because the, the whole space was was just filled by this information and uh, by polarizing views from both sides and that increased the polarization in the country increased the hate speech increased uh, the conflict uh, dynamics so um, it made things worse uh, but we've seen the same thing happening in iraq for example uh, where militias and non-state actors uh, use uh, technology and social media to uh, coordinate attacks to try and silence uh, critics or uh, try and silence independent voices uh, to push them to one side or to or to simply silence them. Um, and and one of the problems in our region is that online threats uh, rarely stay only as online threats. Uh, this information in the, in the Middle East kills people. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi is the most famous example, but uh, over the years, we have had uh, several examples of, uh, of social media uh, personalities, influencers, analysts, uh, others who, who have been either killed or forced to exile or forced to retire, basically, from, from social media and, and be completely silenced. Uh, in Iraq, for example, we have uh, Tara Fares, who was uh, a model uh, and social media personality, and she was killed. Um, Isham al who was a, a security analyst. And all those operations were um, fomented and coordinated on social media. Uh, there were groups, uh, close, uh, close groups that were active in uh, fomenting hate uh, against those personalities, uh, so that uh, waiting for someone to, to strike. Uh, but then the, the actual operations, it seems that, uh, that, that led to their killing were actually co also coordinated on, uh, on close messaging groups. Uh, and then there is the, the, the let's say the, big uh, non-state actor in our region, which is Daesh and terrorist actors. Um, and there it's quite interesting because uh, Daesh at the height of their power were very uh, good at using propaganda and using uh, social media to, to spread their own messaging. And there was a lot of attention given by platforms, by the EU, uh, the states in general, uh, to take down extremist content online, uh, to to reduce the space for this terrorist propaganda to extremist propaganda to uh, spread. Uh, what they've done now, uh, what how they their um, tactics uh, changed is the fact that with all the noise that is generated by the info, the information operations that are run by state and non-state actors, uh, Daesh can manage to actually uh, run their own operations virtually undetected. Um, there's so much noise that is generated. The volume of tweets of uh, of information that is generated so high that it's basically uh, almost impossible to detect them and to uh, and to pick them. And also, there's less attention uh, on the side of social media platforms who were basically shifted some of their uh, resources from the anti-extremist content to uh, to larger information operations. Uh, and then on the civil society side. Um, the situation is quite bleak, uh, to be honest, because um, there is not the same level of organization and every basically state actor in the region uh, has focused on making sure that uh, there is no other Arab Spring, or at least I believe that the Arab Spring is still continuing. It's a, it's an ongoing process, but that there, there cannot be another Twitter revolution. So every time that we've seen uh, protests emerging in the in the region, I'm thinking of Lebanon, for example, or Iraq itself. Um, the, the, there have been efforts by state and non-state actors uh, to uh, divide the opposition, to silence civil society, uh, to create uh, influencers even that had that appeared out of nowhere uh, and that uh, were trying to manipulate public opinion. And so to make sure that civil society could not gather that critical mass that was necessary uh, to actually uh, push for, for change for democratic reforms. So, so they're organizing, um, but the problem is that there's so much repression online and offline 
uh, that it's very hard for them to actually uh, do something significant. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi was actually one of those who uh, tried to push for this uh, with a with a with a project, and uh, and we know what happened to him. So um, that's uh, that's one of the problems that uh, disinformation kills. So even when uh, civil society in the region tries to organize itself, faces offline repression as well. So we've opened up a, a new poll asking whether the EU and international actors can do more to fight disinformation um, and uh, support Alessandro in his efforts. Um, Alessandro, you, you uh, do fill out the poll. And we're, we uh, currently we have 100%. Yes, they should do more. So uh, uh, believing in your mission. Um, but Alessandro, the, it's not all bullying and, and hatred. I mean, we We've had a breakthrough in Libya, uh, with which did happen to some extent online, didn't it? There was a kind of digital campaign. Uh, is that something the EU had uh, anything to do with? I know it was a UN under the UN umbrella. Did you support that? Is that something you think can be replicated? Is there something in that that uh, it offers a light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, we're working in general to empower civil society, to give them a space, to also organize, to... Uh, give them a space to be empowered uh, to address some of the needs. The, the problem is really that um, each context is different, and we've seen it for Israel and Palestine, for example, with uh, the incitement, with the suppression of speech, etc. Um, one of the big problems is also that on the side of, of the social media platforms is that um, their models are based on Western audiences and they do not have, as we said also before, uh, they do not have a real understanding uh, of, of the, the Docker context, uh, but also that the flagging method of flagging content online is really based on a behavior that is present in the US uh, and, in, and in Europe. Um, but civil society do not have access to data, do, do not have access to uh, being able to push these campaigns. And every time that they try to organize a larger campaign, there is pushback from the other side. Uh, and so uh, this is one of the problems. Uh, on Libya specifically, uh, we, we are working with uh, the UN uh, to try and take down content, to try and, uh, and mitigate the effect of uh, this information uh, and try to provide as much analysis as possible and support to, to civil society. Some civil society also prefers not to take down content because they want to be able to foresee the moves of their opponents. But in general, this is what we're trying to we're trying to do. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, at this point, with nine respondents, we have 100% support for you doing more. So uh, good luck with that. Um, thanks. Well, I'm, I have many more questions for you, Alessandro, but I'll come back to, uh, after we've heard from our, our next respondent, um, who will be... Uh, Jane, uh, and she's going to talk to us about Venezuela. For those of you who have just joined us, uh, Jane is uh, our fellow on economics of conflict, and she's our incoming crisis group senior analyst for social media and conflict. She's also a visiting fellow at Princeton University. So thanks, Jane. Um, we've heard of, we've had views on um, uh, what the state side of it is, especially looking at El Salvador in the first panel, um, but uh, opposition and non-state groups, including rebels and criminals uh, and criminal groups, have uh, increasingly turned to social media to communicate not just amongst themselves, but uh, with with the wider public. Um, and how, how is that shaping uh, the, the, the conflict context you, you, you're examining here? Sure. I mean, so I'm going to be talking about Venezuela, which uh, I think it's actually, I'm going to be talking about kind of a pessimistic aspect of how social media has shaped uh, conflict in, in Venezuela among the opposition. But I think that this is actually overall an optimistic story uh, because social media has really shaped how opposition and particularly opposition and action exile has, can communicate among themselves and communicate to citizens within Venezuela. Um, it's been a concerted effort by the Maduro government to push opposition out of the country. Um, they've joined 5 million Venezuelans in, in fleeing. Um, and it, in because of that, it's it's a, a tactic specifically designed to, to fracture the opposition physically. Uh, social media has been incredibly important in allowing these uh, opposition politicians and activists the ability to communicate with citizens back home. And it's offered a way of getting around issues of media freedom in Venezuela that have been very persistent. 
Um, so, so, you know, with that, you know, out migration from Venezuela is really one of the defining features of the crisis. And this includes these activists that have been forced into exile. And, uh, and in our research, we show that actually leaving Venezuela changes how activists express themselves online and makes them more likely to criticize the government in harsh terms and post approvingly about aggressive foreign policies. So even though there's this very positive effect of allowing them to communicate, exile is also worsening polarization among the Venezuelan opposition. And the dynamics of social media are likely exacerbating this polarization even further. And this in turn makes a kind of unified opposition that will be necessary for the kind of negotiations that crisis group has really been promoting for years much more difficult. Um, so since taking power in 2013, Maduro has obviously violated human rights widely, including extrajudicial killings and overseen um, a worsening and incredibly intense humanitarian crisis, including the resurgence of preventable diseases, blackouts, gas shortages. And one consequence of this is that many millions of Venezuelans have fled abroad, um, and this effectively has scattered the opposition as well, because activists are being forced to flee, so that it's forced to operate across borders and with a large diaspora population. Um, since a failed attempt to lead a military uprising in April 2019, Juan Guaido, who's the, the leader of the opposition, has faced growing internal division. More conciliatory factions view negotiations with the government as the, the best way to restore democracy and alleviate, alleviate the humanitarian crisis. More intransigent parts of the opposition believe that coercive pressure by outside powers is the most reliable way to achieve the, the same goals. Um, and, and in that context, social media, as I mentioned, just an incredibly important tool for Venezuela. As more and more people act, operate from abroad and, and pursue activism from abroad, these platforms are really critical for communication. And this includes with international actors like the EU. Um, but there's a there's a pretty widespread perception that uh, that opposition become more willing to embrace extreme positions online when they move abroad. Um, in a personal essay, a Venezuelan exile described this as, as toxic exile, which is defined as someone who, warped by the trauma of exile, adopts political views detrimental to the people back home. Um, and that means that leaving is this politically transformative experience that divides in-country activists from those that live abroad. Uh, to study this more systematically, we analyzed 5 million tweets uh, by 357 activists, uh, uh, 94 of whom left the country. Uh, Venezuela has one of the highest rates of Twitter penetration in the world, and the lack of, of independent media really, really makes this a, a key metric. So we tracked two themes of interest. One was stringent criticism and the other was calls for aggressive foreign action. So stringent criticism included references to fascism, narco-trafficking by the state and Cuban or Russian interference in Venezuela. So like the pointiest end of criticism. All of these have some basis in truth, but they're just the, the kind of sharpest set of criticisms that target Maduro. Calls for aggressive foreign action include references to sanctions and military intervention. Um, so I'm going to show a graph uh, on Slido that shows how the crisis changes after Venezuela, how reactions to the crisis online change after Venezuelan opposition going to exile. So while discussions of both foreign action and stringent criticism of the regime have gone up over time among all the opposition, the rise is being driven in part by the fact that exiles have become much more likely to take more extreme positions after leaving. So the zero month is the, the month that they leave and you see this increase following this. So this graph shows that in the six months before and after leaving the country relative to activists who remained in Venezuela, exiles become significantly more likely to harshly criticize the government, um, which is shown on the top. And they're also more publicly supportive of aggressive foreign intervention, including sanctions and intervention. So by contrast, uh, which we don't show here, but references to service provision, uh, so Venezuela's frequent gas sh shortages, blackouts and medical crises, fall as a share of tweets, suggesting that exiles are less likely to discuss these uniquely kind of domestic problems and more likely to focus on topics that are of interest to international communities. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this. So leaving allows opposition members to actually speak more freely without fearing persecution, which does happen on the basis of things that are said online. They are socialized into new communities that might already hold really firm preferences. So as, as one US former, former official described, 
when Venezuelans are in exile, especially in the US, they're exposed to their own radicals basically in, in the diaspora. And exiled leaders may grow disconnected from the priorities of those who remain in the country, um, just as a, as a result of not actually experiencing those kind of domestic effects. But social media is also contributing to this because it often rewards more hardline rhetoric. So when they leave, exiles join these existing diaspora communities um, and exiles and commenters have reported being harassed online if they express an opinion that's perceived as too moderate that might further intensify, which might further intensify polarization. All this really matters because exiles are highly influential, especially in Venezuela and Twitter is an important means for disseminating opinions Unions, both to foreign actors and within the country, uh, especially given limitations on independent media. So an exiled politician said that uh, influential Venezuelan Twitter users condition with success, often success local politics. Um, and and this, this matters a lot for the, for the Venezuelan crisis because unity among the opposition will be really crucial to any type of negotiated settlement in Venezuela that actually allows us um, some semblance of freedom of elections, or at least that allows us some, some degree of exit from the, the worsening humanitarian crisis. Um, and I think that this case really exemplifies this double-edged sword that we've talked a lot about in the context of social media, that it's really transformed how uh, civil society actors and opposition actors can communicate online, but it is also increasing polarization and conflict, and not only through disinformation, but through pro and uh, and just uh, just through kind of, um, uh, re reaffirming voices that are perhaps more hardline. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Uh, that you've described really well the double-edged sword that I think uh, we're, that the social media is you know, both the same, really important enabler and um, uh, the way it can cut also on the other side. Um, you say these expatriates are mostly in the United States. Um, and yet, at the same time, Europe always has this very su surprisingly salient uh, role in Venezuela. Uh, are there Venezuelan expatriates in Europe? Is there a European role in all this? Is there anything the EU can do? I mean, definitely. So, so there are a lot of Venezuelans in in the United States, uh, but there are also a lot in Spain, um, in other parts of Europe, in Colombia. You know, the diaspora has. Really really internationalized the crisis in a way that's made it really kind of everybody's issue. Um, and so in that, in that case, there is a lot more that the EU can do it and really has been doing. You know, e the EU has been really central in, in the little bit of opening that we've seen in terms of providing humanitarian assistance uh, within Venezuela. Um, on the online aspect in particular, I mean, I think part of this is, is thinking, I mean, in this case, what's, what's kind of fascinating about the Venezuelan opposition is that they're certainly not breaking any moderation policies on, on, on Twitter, right? They're, they're certainly not saying anything that would get them deplatformed. They're just expressing a range of viewpoints, um, but in a way that might be a bit more provocative after they leave the country. And because of that, I think that this is actually the case where the EU's influence can be strongest offline. Uh, this is this means basically talking to a wide range of actors. You hold a variety of viewpoints, making sure to talk to people who are actually operating the country. Um, I think that one of the kind of effects of exile is that exiles are just much more proximate to foreign governments. This makes sense. It's hard to travel into and out of Venezuela for many of the opposition. And what that means is that exile voices are often more proximate um, and are very important to listen to. This is not a, a knock on exiles at all. They have an incredibly important um, important role. Uh, but it's also important to make sure that we balance this with voices that are in the country and uh, and who have seen the kind of deteriorating uh, humanitarian situation firsthand as well. Um, and so this is a case where I think that the EU can really prioritize uh, getting a wide range of voices involved in these discussions and where the influence on pressuring platforms or uh, influencing online rhetoric is, is important insofar as, as with all um, kind of instances of negotiation and uh, mediation and conflict, we, we uh, are cognizant of disinformation and, uh, and the, the kind of tone of information that's being spread. Thank you, Jane. Um, and if anyone really wants to follow up on 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 that Venezuela uh, uh, issue, the, 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 there's an excellent essay by by Jane on 
on, on, on our website, crisisgroup.org. Uh, just go to the Venezuela page and you'll soon find it. And um, moving on now to Cameroon, where I, I would like to uh, introduce our third speaker in this panel, who is Ari Ndui, who joined Crisis Group uh, just a couple of years ago in 2019 as our senior analyst for Cameroon. Um, and uh, he focuses particularly on the Anglophone conflict, uh, but also national socio-political tensions and wider threats to security in Cameroon. Um, prior to joining Crisis Group, Ari was a diplomat. He worked for as head of political section at the British High Commission in Yaoundé. Um, before the, a decade in diplomacy and international development, he served as managing editor for an educational publisher with footprints in Cameroon, Nigeria, and Ghana. Uh, Ari studied business administration at Harriet Watt University and international relations at the University of London. Uh, Ari, for some reason, I, Cameroon is always with me because uh, I watched the crisis group uh, 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 social media feed and the Cameroonian activists of all kinds always tag crisisgroup.org. So I have I've been exposed to the, 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 the vitriolic level of, of conversation that there is with ghastly pictures coming up all the time. So I'm, 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 I'm really mm -hmm. looking forward to hearing your explanation of what's going on um, as these non-state groups, uh, opposition groups, rebel and criminal groups have, uh, have turned to social media to communicate with an audience that definitely includes <coughs> us. And uh, what's the impact over, overall beyond uh, the small, small aspect of, of my own Twitter feed? Okay, thank you, Yuk. Um, uh, firstly, the situation in Cameroon, we have two slightly different uh, uh, situations. Uh, first, we have uh, the crisis or conflict, separatist conflict in the Anglophone regions of Cameroon, uh, which started off uh, with a peaceful protest, but a lot of this were, was driven on social media. A lot of the activists were working on, on social media. So the conflict, the crisis has kind of had um, uh, a social media, uh, a very strong social media footprint from uh, 20. 16 uh, and 2017 early days of, of crisis. But uh, on the second state, we also have uh, what we can term more generally as uh, uh, central political and ethnic tensions, which is not uh, related to the Anglophone crisis in the west of the country, but it's more about uh, the, the crisis, the, the, the tensions, the, uh, the, 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 the competition uh, to succeed uh, Mr. Bia at the helm uh, of the country, which has uh, pitted uh, the opposition, mainly led by Maurice Camto uh, and the incumbent president, uh, Paul Bia, who have been on seat since uh, 1982. So these two uh, is, also, uh, uh, is also creating a, a very strong uh, social uh, media uh, footprint. Uh, let, let me start first uh, briefly uh, with, with the Anglophone uh, crisis to just show a bit of uh, what uh, non-state the armed groups uh, are doing uh, there to shape uh, conflict. Uh, well, first, um, uh, the, the non-state armed groups in the in, in the Anglophone region, so we can refer to them as as armed separatists. How have they used uh, social media? How are they using social media? Uh, one, they are publicizing uh, their the cause, their political cause. They're using social media to raise uh, support but also because of the interactive nature of social media, uh, they are using it to engage with their, with their audience, uh, audiences. Uh, they are obtaining live, live feedback uh, in a way that will not be possible you know, for, for social media. And just to note, uh, the principal uh, social uh, media uh, platform being used in Cameroon generally, particularly uh, in the Anglophone regions is, is Facebook. Uh, uh, Non-state uh, armed groups are also um, running internet uh, TV. Uh, most of these in the early days were based solely on, on social media. Uh, you can talk of uh, uh, SBC, which is the Southern Cameroon's Broadcasting Corporation. You also have something from a rival uh, separatist organization, the, the ABC, uh, Ambazonia Broadcasting Corporation. They also have more recently a ABN, Ambazonia Broadcasting Network. 
Uh, fourth thing that they do with uh, these groups do with uh, social media, they use it to raise funds. Uh, you, this partly explains why we have uh, so many vitriolic, violent uh, videos of sometimes of attacks, sometimes of atrocities, uh, um, um, torture uh, of civilians or the direct participants uh, in, in the conflict. It could be the separatists or soldiers. Uh, you have those things uh, on, on, on social media, partly because uh, the groups are trying to use it uh, not just for propaganda, there's a lot of propaganda, but also to use it to demonstrate uh, their effectiveness as part of their fundraising uh, strategy. Uh, for those who know a bit about the, the crisis, you remember that uh, a lot of the Anglophone leaders uh, one are now also called uh, separatists, are out of the country. Some fled the country long ago, but uh, more recently, just as it, uh, the crisis was uh, beginning to take shape in 2016 and 2017, uh, another, another sort of Anglophone leaders left. A lot of these people are out of the country, uh, in the US, uh, in Europe, in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in other parts of the world. And they look up to see these videos uh, the, the armed groups on, on the field use these videos uh, to kind of demonstrate their capability uh, and to justify uh, their use of funds. So it's a kind of uh, a fundraising uh, strategy also. Um, a lot of these videos uh, are also for propaganda. Um, it's also uh, messaging to, to the state authorities, to the government, uh, on the levels uh, of violence that the non-state armed groups are also able uh, to, to perform. Uh, a lot of it is also uh, just about uh, fear, mong fear mong mongering, uh, to spread fear, uh, to spread uh, threats uh, uh, against uh, other people. Uh, but in the case where these uh, videos were posting on social media is being used to expose uh, atrocities, or on the one side, uh, it appears to be a very negative use of social media. But the other argument is that uh, in, in an environment where uh, normal traditional media like the print, uh, TV, and audiovisual are not being allowed by the authorities to fully report what's happening uh, in the conflict, social media, especially Facebook and partly Twitter, are now the principal ways by which people are expressing themselves, are exposing some of the uh, really uh, uh, terrible things that are happening to them inside uh, this conflict. For, for analysts, uh, for, for, for media houses, uh, for professionals, for those who are studying conflict, uh, without some of these uh, publications, without some of these uh, sometimes very gruesome videos, without some of these live attack videos, uh, there'll be very uh, little information on the nature uh, of the conflict that's happening in the, in the Anglophone uh, regions. So there, there is a hard balancing act uh, uh, to, to try to, to make them. Uh, uh, in addition, um, the non-state armed groups use social media to also threaten uh, opponents, rivals. Uh, there's a lot of division. Uh, sometimes it changes uh, depending, on, depending on which epoch you are looking uh, at, the, at the crisis in the Anglophone regions. Uh, there have been times where the groups are, are more uh, uh, closely uh, linked. Uh, they are more united in their purpose and focus. Uh, other times, uh, it's, it's, it's almost some cacophony, and everyone is trying to do their own thing, and they're more interested in, in, in out, outpacing the, the other group. So they use uh, videos to ridicule other groups uh, to demonstrate that uh, maybe one group is the one which is more active, which is more engaged, uh, and also trying to place themselves, market themselves uh, uh, po politically. So in a nutshell, that's how uh, these groups are using uh, uh, social media in the Anglophone crisis. But when you come to the uh, more central political uh, uh, scene, uh, where it's more about political and ethnic tensions, uh, mostly between the supporters of uh, the current president, uh, Paul Bia, uh, and uh, the main opposition uh, person, uh, Maurice Camto, who each uh, come from uh, different uh, ethnocultural parts of the country, um, uh, social media is being used more as a vehicle of hate speech, 
um, uh, the, the, the activists on, on, on social media uh, are using a lot of inflammatory uh, language, uh, sometimes very incendiary. We've got a lot of fake news uh, also. Uh, and some people were bystanders in, in the beginning when this political uh, any disputes uh, started because of, of the, the mass of uh, this information on social media, especially on Facebook, are now beginning to take interest. Um, uh, the, the activists are building consciousness uh, around this. And this has kind of uh, uh, broken down uh, Cameroonian society almost in, in, like, in like camps, although it has not transformed into uh, a widespread or regular violence uh, uh, of, offline, actually. But a lot of what's happening on social media is actually uh, some reflection of the things and frustrations that people have offline. And sometimes they do not have the means to express themselves because the media is very tightly controlled uh, in the country. Uh, when with the anonymity that social media uh, now uh, provide for people, uh, people go onto social media to express their anger against the government, to attack uh, some people uh, whom they will not be able to to readily attack uh, in, in daily life off, offline. So it's, uh, it's a slightly different uh, scenario in Cameroon, depending on uh, which of the crises or which of the situations uh, you look at. But what we can uh, simply draw as a conclusion is that uh, social media has given uh, a voice. Uh, it's a tool for, for organization. It's a very strong political tool for non-state non uh, groups. Uh, and it now gives them uh, some sort of uh, leverage also against uh, the government, which had or which she has very, very strong control of traditional uh, media. Ari, that, that was fascinating. I, I, you, you've given me some explanations about the scenes that come up in my feed. And I have to agree with you on one point is that I did not get how violent it was until I saw this. <laughs> Those, those things in my feed, and it really opened my eyes to what people are facing in, in Cameroon. Um, obviously, the Anglophone, on the Anglophone side of the, uh, of the conflict uh, in, um, in Cameroon, this is very much a child of uh, Europe's in, uh, previous colonial past in, in, in Cameroon, with the British on one side and the French on the other. Is there any current connection to Europe that uh, we can highlight for our European policy audience? Is there something that uh, our European states or the EU could do to mitigate what the, 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 the bad side of what you're, you're talking about? And uh, yeah. also, if you, if you would uh, also, if you think that the, the, it's more about the social media companies, please uh, come up with any ideas you'd, ha you'd have for them as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, th I think it's both. Uh, th there are things which the uh, uh, the EU can can handle or support or or or, or be, be a, a sponsor too. Uh, but we also have things which uh, more readily fall in the plate of the social media companies uh, concerned, uh, principally Facebook and uh, but but also Twitter uh, increasingly. Um, EU, I think uh, some EU countries have shown um, uh, interest in, in, in the problem, the problematic of uh, misinformation and hate speech uh, in the country. Uh, but we also find ourselves in an environment in Cameroon where civil speak, space has, has reduced drastically as a result of all these tensions and threats. Uh, to the unity and stability of the country, which uh, the government uh, uh, is facing, uh, but also because of the government's uh, earlier predisposition to try to limit the expression of the uh, the opposition. So they, they will have to try to uh, to, to balance uh, the act, um, but there's a lot that, that can be done by supporting uh, institutions uh, to try to moderate. And we'll talk about institutions here, uh, th th there are concerns that if uh, if partners try to get the government to get too involved in regulating uh, social media, it might be counterproductive because that might mean that uh, the space for people expressing uh, themselves uh, reduces even further by a more a, a more hardline approach from the government. So maybe uh, the, the route to go is to work with uh, the civil society in the country. Um, uh, also work with the political parties uh, 
uh, who have done very little or almost nothing at all to kind of rein in on their supporters who are most of the purveyors of this uh, uh, hate speech uh, online uh, in, in Cameroon, especially regarding uh, the political and any tensions. Uh, but in, in, in the Anglophone crisis, uh, for example, uh, there's a sort of feeling that uh, maybe we've gotten past the stage where uh, trying to control or moderate uh, social media better can have uh, a significant benefit uh, to the situation on the ground. Uh, because as, as you might know, there was a time in 2017 when the government cut down internet to the Anglophone regions for three months. Um, it did not uh, stop the, the crisis from developing. Uh, actually, uh, arguably, uh, it radicalized uh, more people. There are times when uh, the networks have been slowed down uh, in Cameroon to try to reduce the propagation of uh, some of these uh, kind of uh, vitriolic uh, posting on, on the internet. But these have not had real impact on the ground. So maybe the EU should look at uh, actually working with the Cameroonian uh, institutions, civil society, and the opposition groups, both in the Anglophone uh, uh, areas, but also in the central uh, uh, po uh, political uh, scenario, to actually address the, the offline drivers of some of these disputes, which have now been converted and, been ex uh, and are being expressed as, as online hate speech, as, as a promotion and call for violence uh, online. Um, the other thing that uh, the EU could do uh, is to promote engagement between uh, social media uh, companies uh, and the government. The, relation, the relationship between uh, these two has not been, been great. Uh, maybe if the EU, EU can add its uh, political voice, it might be something uh, uh, that, that, that might help. Uh, but also to support political parties specifically to develop guidelines for their own uh, users, maybe to try to bring in more responsible uh, uh, social media uh, users in, in, in the country. Thanks, Harry. Uh, we're, we're opening up the, the, the questions on the floor. We have a first question for, for, for Ari. Um, which I'll pass on to, to in a moment. We have eight more minutes, so push push them through if there's anything more that uh, you'd like to know from our excellent and esteemed guest um, panelists. Um, but uh, Ari, before I turn to you with the question, um, <coughs> well, let, Ari, let, let's go straight to. I mean, how, do you think that social media can be used to stimulate dialogue? among communities and even provoke, produce a reverse dynamic, easing violent rhetoric. Have you seen an example of that? Do you think it could happen and how? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's possible to, to, to get that at you. Uh, but we should also note that uh, uh, some of the work of this, uh, the preponderance of this uh, the online uh, activist has actually, uh, in some respects, uh, stifled debate uh, because uh, the, the other side, one of the dark sides of social media is uh, is a social media lynching, uh, which has led to many people uh, recoiling and not expressing themselves uh, freely, especially in situations where uh, there are armed groups which are operating and we can actually uh, draw uh, links between what's happening, what people say politically uh, online uh, and uh, to underground action. Uh, so yes, perhaps uh, uh, things uh, can be done in that light, but I think uh, the basis uh, actually uh, in the Cameroon scenario uh, is to start by addressing the drivers of these tensions uh, for the central political and ethnic uh, uh, issues, uh, but in, in the Anglophone regions to actually look at uh, the root causes of the conflict, of the crisis, uh, of the dispute. Um, uh, without that, just having uh, 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 some form of social media uh, promotion or re-engineering to get people maybe to be <laughs> a bit more cautious about what they do uh, may actually have a, a little benefit because I think we've, we've missed the point where those sort of actions uh, could, could be done. I think a bit more now needs to be done. Uh, a lot of it has to happen offline 
uh, and then carried from offline uh, to the online space and then to build for there. And then we, we can build uh, uh, vice versa, a kind of motion in, in both, for both sides, say on, online and offline and uh, the two moving uh, together to create kind of synergy. Thanks. Alessandra, you've been listening to what Ari has been saying about the, the offline potential. I'm thinking of what we heard about what happened in Libya, where um, the UN mission there uh, engaged actors from across the political spectrum on social media and uh, helped that help produce a code of ethics to turn down hateful and unacceptable content. Um, also, at, 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 when it came to the actual discussions on a, on, on a new Libyan um, uh, I hesitate to say constitution, but an article of the ceasefire anyway, and there was an anti-hate speech provision in there. Is, is there any, from what you're hearing from Ari, Ari saying about Cameron, is there a role for, for uh, outsiders like the EU to try and push such ideas offline and hope that they will transfer on? I think it's definitely uh, a new frontier for both uh, track to diplomacy and for uh, conflict mediation, uh, the idea of, uh, of pushing uh, actors who are responsible for, for uh, I mean, this is what we would do uh, offline, you know, like when you're, when you're trying to mediate uh, in a conflict and try to re reduce uh, risk uh, and violence, uh, you would try to put, bring people together. Um, I, I'm a little bit personally pessimistic about uh, the option of using social media to uh to kind of de-escalate tension i don't think that social media works well to unpolarize because it creates polarization as it is uh, but i do think that uh, offline engagement and engagement with different actors to bring them together to agree on a code of ethics uh, to agree to uh, uh, de-escalate tensions can can actually uh, can actually work and it, and it does work in, uh, in in some cases thanks um and we're, we're going to be wrapping up in, in, in a few minutes. So I'm going to pass uh, one more question to uh, Jane. And uh, that is from, our, from one of our members of the audience. Uh, was struck by your comment about 5 million tweets, which I guess is a methodological question of how on earth do you manage to analyze so many tweets and make sense of them? And while you're talking, I would really like, we've heard a lot about the polarization drive of social media. And yet one interesting thing you said about Venezuela is that you came out optimistic that in fact, social media was a force that somehow was helping in, the, in overall. So while answering the 5 million, within two, two minutes or so, uh, uh, how, why are you still, why do you remain optimistic? Um, so sure, I'll start with a methodological question. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, it's a shameless self-promotion now, but I think that this is one of the reasons that it's, it's uh, good to have quantitative social scientists around because it offers an alternative way of analyzing social media and other conflicts, uh, you know, on and offline, um, at, you know, compared to qualitative research, uh, which is also incredibly important, but which gives you one particular perspective. And, and what we could do with the 5 million tweets was basically automatically do a content uh, analysis based on a kind of dictionary of words. Um, and this is actually something that, that social media companies have been promoting is the, the, the use by academics and civil society of, of their platforms for data collection. So Twitter has a very um, now open academic API that allows you to basically collect tweets. Facebook has crowd data which lets you uh, kind of use a search term and automatically download public Facebook posts with that information. Um, and that, that's that been an incredibly useful tool for doing this kind of bigger uh, uh, overarching analysis of social media. That doesn't replace qualitative analysis of social media. I think that that can, uh, that is really where you have to do the, the sniff test and make sure that it, you understand in reality, but I think that a quantitative analysis of this sort can be a useful um, way of understanding the scope of the problem um, and the, the kind of levels. Um, in terms of the, the kind of broader question about the about optimism about social media, I mean, I, I try to I try to remain optimistic that uh, that social media is overall. I have 
has this extremely democratizing effect on political communication. And, and I think that in many places that is good. Uh, I think that social media companies can still do more to, to kind of exploit this and promote this. Ari really opened my eyes in the Cameroon case to, to the incredible power of verification as a tool of making sure that opposition voices are heard. Um, in Venezuela, I think that the fact that we now have exile communities speaking so freely and constantly to among one another is overall good. It means that when people leave home, um, which is often, uh, you know, the, the result of many crises across the world, not just Venezuela, a huge diaspora populations, it means better communication among families, it means activism from abroad in areas where people inside the country might feel unsafe. Um, and of course, there are also the effects of being able to coordinate around protest, being able to spread information. But, you know, as, as we've said again and again, it's a double-edged sword. And I think what, what really comes through in the panel again and again is how context specific it is, which is both a, a challenge and, and an opportunity. Uh, we often talk about the role of social media as this kind of top line thing, but, you know, changes in the algorithm or, or changes in, in, uh, in what news content gets promoted, but that the effects of those changes are going to vary widely across countries. Um, particularly armed groups when we're talking about our, and, and non-state actors are extremely adaptable in their responses to these kinds of policy changes. Um, so understanding the effects of those, uh, even top level policy changes is really gonna be important to have country level research of the type that we've heard on this panel, the crisis group does, um, and understanding those effects and and the use of social media in, in particular context is really how we build policy um, around social media in general, I think. Um, so I, I, I have really enjoyed learning more about all of these conflicts. And I think that this is the kind of research that can get us to, to really better understanding these, these conflict dynamics and the relationship to social media. Well, as, as we all have, thank you very much, Jane, for wrapping it up on, on a somewhat optimistic note. And um, thank you, Ari, for bringing us that really important local detail from Cameron and to Alessandro for really opening my eyes to what the EU can and is doing and very specifically as well, which is we're always very grateful for. Um, to our audience, please uh, linger on for a few minutes if you're still there to say, to give us a little readout on what you found out about this. Um, I'm glad to see that the first two respondents learned a lot um, and uh, uh, we're always open to any other private messages as well. So thank you all, thank you uh, dear panelists and uh, we hope to meet you on other crisis talks uh, uh, in the future. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.